Now, I, I have this conviction. It's a conviction that I've shared here before, uh, but it's about the Bible and the scriptures, and, and it's simply this. Uh, a text can never mean what it has never meant. Uh, when we come, and what I mean by that is when we come to the scriptures, we're, we're not afforded the luxury of just reading a random text and then trying to figure out on the spot what it means and how to apply it. That's, that's actually not how we read the scripture. When we come to the scripture, we must do kind of the, 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 the hard work of trying to figure out, okay, who was this originally said to and why? And it's actually through that process that we find out what the primary meaning of the text is, and then we can... Uh, answer, okay, what does this mean to my life? You understand that? A text can never mean what it has never meant. And so this morning, what I want to do is I want to give us the context of Isaiah chapter 9. Like, I want you to, to kind of fully understand what was happening around uh, kind of so, some of the comments we're going to be looking at today. Uh, now, the book of Isaiah is a really interesting book. And, and what I mean by that is that it wasn't uh, written all at once. Like, no one sat down and just penned the whole book. It was actually written in different segments at different times. So there's actually different parts of the book that have a completely different context than other parts. But the beginning, so what I'm doing is I'm giving you the context for the beginning of the book of Isaiah. We're going back 2,700 years ago, okay? So we're going back, okay, quite a ways. And, and what we find at this time... <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, was that Israel was in a bad place. Uh, they were in a, a rough, rough season. Um, they were a divided kingdom, kind of had their own separation, so you kind of had like a northern kingdom, a southern kingdom, it, it, but, it, but it wasn't just division that, that kind of moved its way into Israel. It was also oppression. Uh, they were oppressing the poor. It was rebellion, uh, th th their hearts actually turned away from God. Uh, they were worshiping other gods. So what God does is he raises up the prophet Isaiah to speak God's words over the people of Israel. And, and that's a tough job in a season like that. Because the message that Isaiah had to bring was, was, was hard and hopeful. Okay, he, he, Here's where it was hard. Here's the beginning of Isaiah. Here's what Isaiah says uh, to Israel. He says, listen, you've all walked away from God. You're oppressing the poor. You've, you, you're worshiping other gods. And because of this, here's the hard news, okay? The nations are gonna rise up and take you out. That's, that's a hard message to give, right? The nations are gonna rise up and are gonna conquer you. But because of this, God's not going to leave you. This moment where you're going to be conquered and moved into exile, this, this is going to be like a purifying fire of sorts. This is, this is God's attempt to burn away all that has gone wrong inside of you so that he can bring you back to himself. That's the, that's the hard news. But even in the midst of the hard news, there is hope. And here's the hope, Isaiah 9, 6, the banner verse. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. <laughs> I love it. Isaiah says, listen, you've walked away from God, and because of this, we have hard days coming. The nations are going to rise up conquer us, but there is hope, and this is the hope that one day the Messiah is coming. One day our Savior is coming. One day hope is coming, and he will be called the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. This is the hope that they're given in the midst of of a broken situation. So this series, There Is Hope, we're, 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 we're looking at those four different aspects. So last week, Pastor Gary gave a message on the first title given, and that is The Wonderful Counselor. And today, with God's help, I'm gonna bring us into the second one, and that is Mighty God. Come on, turn to your neighbor and just say, Mighty God. Mighty God. Now, Interestingly, Isaiah actually never said the words mighty God. Uh, those are English words. 
Uh, Isaiah was written in the Hebrew language, and what he would have said is actually the El Gabor. Uh, the, the word, the Hebrew word for mighty is the word Gabor, which kind of means like a mighty man or a, he, a hero, and, and God is the word El, El, or, or it could be God or the Almighty One. So Isaiah says the hope that we have is that the one who's coming is the El Gabor, the, the God of all might, or it can be translated this way, the mighty Almighty. I just like that one, you know, the mighty Almighty. So, so here's the picture. Isaiah says there's hope. The one who's coming is the mighty God, the El Gabor, the, the mighty Almighty. So, so it, 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 it's a beautiful picture, right? And this is on full display in the very next verse. Look at verse 7. Just go to the very next one. Isaiah 9, 7, he goes on to say, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. And he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. Somebody just say forever. Oh, come on, that's good. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Isaiah says the one who's coming is so mighty that one day he's going to establish a kingdom that will never, ever ever end. It's going to go on forever and ever. So what does Israel do? Well, they go into a season of waiting, longing, praying for the day when this would actually come true. They waited day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade, century after century. They waited. I imagine for some during this time that the Messiah, the mighty God, became a myth, a fiction, a nice fanciful story that was passed down from generation to generation, while for others, they longed for him, they yearned for him, waiting, praying for the day when the mighty God, the El Gabor, would come and set them free. They waited. And then on a day that would have just seemed like any other ordinary day, 700 years after the prophecy was made, 700 years after, an angel shows up to a young woman named Mary and said this, Luke 1, verse 31. The angel says to Mary, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. So, Parkwood, I just want to connect the dots for you if you haven't already connected them. 700 years before the angel, Isaiah says, To us a child is born, to us a son is given. 700 years later, the angel says to Mary, your child is the son of the Most High. Isaiah says, and he will reign on David's throne. The angel says, Jesus will reign on the throne of his father, David. Isaiah says, of his government, there will be no end. The angel says, Jesus' kingdom will never end. Are, are you connecting the dots? Okay, I'm, I'm piecing together 700 years of history here, okay? Jesus is the fulfillment fulfillment of every single thing that Isaiah was prophesying. Jesus is the absolute fulfillment of everything. Jesus is the El Gabor, the mighty God, the, the mighty almighty. That's a description of Jesus. So what I want to do for a few minutes this morning is I want to break this down as simple as I know how. Okay, we're going to look at both aspects of this and then we'll at the end, talk about what it means uh, for us. But here's the first point. If, if you're taking notes, just write this down. Jesus is mighty. Jesus is mighty. Like, have you ever noticed that in Jesus' life and ministry that he just seemed to operate in an unreal amount of power and authority? Have you noticed this? 
Like there's this one scene where Jesus wanted some figs. So he went up to a fig tree and it had no figs on it. So Jesus curses the tree and it dies. I wish I could do that. You know, like, he, unreal amount of power and authority. Another scene, he's, he's on the boat. Remember, the storm comes, and what does Jesus do? He speaks to the wind and the waves, and what happens? They listen. The wind listens to Jesus. The, the storm listens to Jesus. Or I, I love when Jesus one day, he's got a mass crowd of people around him, and he takes a little boy's snack pack lunch right, and blesses it, and it just multiplies over and over, and somehow, out of this little snack pack, Jesus is able to feed thousands upon thousands of people. Unreal amount of power and authority. Have you ever noticed that in Jesus's life and ministry that he never, not once, had an argument with a demon? Like, like there's, there's no moment recorded in Scripture where Jesus is like, demon, get out! And the demon's like, not tonight, Jesus! We're going to fight to the death. It doesn't happen. But you know what does happen? There's this one scene where Jesus walks into a synagogue, and there's a demon-possessed man who sees him, and what comes out of his mouth is interesting. The, the demon speaks and says, I know who you are, Jesus, the Holy One of God. Have you come here to destroy me? That's not a demon saying, hey, let's duke it out. That's a demon saying, uh-oh, right? Like, he never argues with demons. And then on top of that, he also has authority over disease. To the lame, he says, walk. To the deaf, he says, hear. The blind, he gives sight. Like, like he has authority over disease. He's got authority over death. This little girl in Talitha, dead in her house. Jesus walks in and says, Talitha, get up. And in that moment, she <gasps> sucks in and breathes in air again and lives. He also did this to Lazarus, who is dead for days. And Jesus himself, if you haven't heard, also came back to life after dying. Okay? He operates in an unreal amount of power and authority. But what I want to show you this morning is, is, is simply this, that, that Jesus' power and authority is not just limited to his 33 years on earth. I, I want to read you a very important text out of Colossians chapter 1. This is what the Apostle Paul teaches the church in Colossae. Uh, chapter 1, verse 16. He says this, For by him, now we need to be clear here, who's the him? Jesus. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Verse 17 says, and he is before all things and in him all things hold together. Now, this is a pretty unbelievable statement because Paul doesn't say that Jesus just has dominion over all things. He says Jesus is the creator of all things. And then he takes that all things statement and he breaks it into two different categories, visible and invisible, right? Th that which we can see and touch and that which we cannot see and touch, the material and the spiritual. Like, just break that down for a moment, right? You think about the... The, the, the visible, right? Parkwood, if you can see it, taste it, smell it, touch it, if you can experience it in any way, Jesus created it. And then beyond that, there's the invisible, right? That which we cannot see. The laws of physics that govern our, our universe. The angels, the demons, the heavens, the hell, that which we cannot see right now, he created that also. And then Paul says, so he's the creator, Jesus Christ, the, the, the Christ child that was in the manger on that first Christmas. He is the, that child is the creator of the universe. Like you want a hopeful Christmas message, try to pack that into your head. Jesus is the creator God. He is the creator of everything seen and he is the creator of everything unseen. And then Paul says, I love it, right in there. And he says, oh, also, everything seen and unseen, he's the one holding it all together. 
So we took communion just a few moments ago. Think about that moment for Jesus. As the Pharisees were making their wild accusations, Jesus was the one giving them the breath to make those accusations. As the Roman soldiers picked up the whips, Jesus was the one giving them the strength to do so. And as he hung on that cross, Jesus was the one holding in the nails. Jesus is mighty. And this Christmas, man, we just gotta get there. Jesus is mighty. But he's not just mighty. Here's my second point. Jesus is God. 700 years before Jesus came into the world on that first Christmas, Isaiah prophesied that the one who come would be the El Gabor, not just the Gabor, not just the, the, the mighty one, but the El God. Jesus is God. He's not a lesser form of God. He is God in the flesh. For us. Now, now, clearly, not everybody believes this, right? The, the Muslims don't believe this. They believe Jesus is a prophet. The Jews believe that he's a false messianic claim. The Mormons believe that Jesus is the spirit brother of Lucifer, the devil. The Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus is the archangel Michael, and many atheists or agnostics today simply see him as an ancient philosopher. Nothing more, nothing less. But the question today isn't really what do other people think about Jesus being God. The question this morning that I think is going to be very interesting is this. What did Jesus think about himself being God? Like, interesting, right? Did Jesus actually believe that he was the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy? Did, did, did Jesus believe that he was not just Gabor, but that he's the El Gabor, that, that, that he is God in the flesh? Did he believe this? Well, I, I, I just want to show you um, a few Bible verses really quick. Uh, Luke 10. I'm, I'm going to hop pretty fast here, so they'll be up on the screen. But, but in Luke 10, Jesus sends out the 72 and on mission, and they're all loving, serving, and they come back, and there's like this debrief moment, and everyone's giddy, right? They're like, Jesus, you won't believe it. Even the demons are subject to your name, and it's like this, this awesome moment. They're talking back and forth, and then Jesus seems to, for a moment, split from the conversation, and he makes this statement, Luke 10, 18. He says, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Imagine hearing that for the first time. Just like, so, sorry, come again? <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> you were there? Right? Like, like that, that's a bold statement. Or, or how about in John chapter 8? John chapter 8, uh, you have um, the Jews who, who are calling Jesus a demon-possessed Samaritan. Now, today, you're like, well, that's not that bad of a burn. 2,000 years ago, this is quite literally the most hostile thing that you can say to somebody. And what Jesus does is he starts talking about Abraham. You guys know Abraham? Remember? Abraham lived thousands of years ago. We even wrote a song about him. Father Abraham had many sons. Oh, that's good. You all went to Sunday school. Okay. <laughs> Jesus starts talking about Abraham. And, and, and watch this, John 8, 56 to 58, he says, your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You're not 50 years old, they said to him, and you've seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Now, this is important. Jesus takes the personal self-description of God, the name of God given to Moses in the burning bush. And he says, yeah, I'm him. I'm the God that was in the burning bush. I am. And you know what happened next? They picked up stones to kill him in that moment. 
The Jews picked up stones. They wanted to kill Jesus. Why? Because Jesus just said he was really old? No. Because Jesus just said that he was God. And they knew it. I'll, I'll, I'll give you one more. Uh, John chapter 20. After the resurrection of Jesus, uh, it's an amazing scene. Uh, all the disciples get to see the, the, the risen Savior except one, Thomas. Thomas doesn't get to see him for seven days. Now, that's a miserable seven days when everyone else, all your friends have seen him and you haven't. So Thomas, sometimes we give Thomas, like, we're, we're harsh on him. All of us would be frustrated if that was us. He goes seven days without seeing Jesus. He doubts, but then there's this moment where he sees Jesus alive and he touches the, the holes in his wrist and his side where the spear went in. And it's interesting what comes out of his mouth. John 20, 28, Thomas said to him, that's Jesus, my Lord and my God. And Jesus does not correct him for this. If ever there was a moment for Jesus to set things straight, this is it. Listen, Thomas, I don't know how you got there. <laughs> oh, man, this thing's really spiraled out of control. Like, God, it, it doesn't happen. You know what actually does happen? Jesus commends him for his understanding. You're right, Thomas. I am God. You, you know, like, it's amazing. P Parkwood, like, just... Jesus is the mighty God. Like, before we talk about us for a moment, like, he is mighty and he is God. He is the El Gabor. And this is a very powerful truth because what I want to do next is I want to try to bring this, this home for us today. Uh, in fact, worship team, come on, come on back up. So what does this mean for us? Like it's, it's nice and kind of fun to think about how strong and mighty Jesus is, but what, 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 is it, what does it mean? How does it apply today? Well, I'll, I'll tell you how it applies, ready? I'll tell you what it means. It means, Parkwood, that there is hope. I'm gonna say that again because no one cheered. It means there is hope. <laughs> like, how do we know that there's hope. How do we know that there's hope? This is, because Jesus is not just the mighty God, Jesus is our mighty God. See, the good news is not just that there is a mighty God out there somewhere, the good news is that Jesus is our mighty God working on our behalf right here and right now. You see, we like Israel, 2,700 years ago when Isaiah made that prophecy, we, we find ourselves in a very similar season and situation than they were in. The world around us is broken. It's fractured. And we breathe that in every day. From sickness in the body racism to hatred and violence and war sex trafficking I mean the list I mean I could stand up here for a long time and start citing things that are broken with this world right now we find ourselves in a very similar season and situation that they're in and then on top of all the brokenness, the scriptures also say that there's a devil. There's an enemy of our soul who roams around like a lion seeking whomever he may devour. It's busted. The battle's real. Every day we understand this and we feel this. And we, like Israel, are in a season of waiting. See, when Jesus came the first time, that, that very first Christmas, he, his, his power was, was on full display not to come and conquer the Assyrians or the Babylonians or the Egyptians or the Romans or whoever else took over Israel. That's not why he came. He came to 
to take on an even greater nemesis than all of them. He came to take on the nemesis of sin, death, and shame. And, and he did that on the cross. And so now, for everyone, not just Israel, but for all of humanity, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord can be saved. That's what Jesus accomplished the first time. It's amazing news, but it doesn't stop there. The story doesn't stop there. The El Gabor, the mighty God, is coming back. And when he does, you, you have to understand this, when he does, man, he's going to right every wrong. He's going to fix every broken space in this universe. He's going He's gonna do amazing things when he returns. He's gonna finish the job that he started. Like this is the hope that we have at Christmas. And so we like Israel, we find ourselves in a season of waiting and longing, praying for the day when the mighty God, the, the mighty almighty is gonna come and finally do away with everything that is wrong. We're waiting for the mighty God. Parkwood, I'm, I'm hungry, thirsty for his return. I gotta tell you, this past week, I, uh, we, we, we buried my stepfather. And at the funeral, we had a great time honoring his life, but it was another reminder that it's broken. This life right now is not the way that it was meant to be. But there's hope, there's hope that the mighty God is coming back. Can we, can we stand on up to our feet? I'm gonna read one more passage of scripture for us. You wanna know what our problem is? <laughs> Let me tell you. Our problem is that we live on earth now in its broken state. And because of this, we, man, because of this, it's, it's like our spiritual vision is blurred. And there's moments and there's days and there's seasons when this whole message, the mighty God, Jesus Christ himself, we have a hard time seeing that. Sure, we have words in, in, in scripture, but like we have a hard time believing it. And the reason why we have a hard time believing it is because we exist in this broken world right now. But do you wanna know where, where there's no confusion, there's no blurred vision around how mighty Jesus is? That's in heaven right now. In, in the book of Revelation, John gets access into heaven. And there's this, this moment where there's this angel, singular, one angel who's, who's taking John around heaven and showing him different things. Two different times, John falls at the feet of the angel and starts to worship him. Now, even I know that's wrong, right? Two different times. He's so overwhelmed by what he's seeing in the power of this angel that he falls and the angel is not having it. He's like, buddy, get up. Get up. Get up, I'm not Jesus, I'm not God. <laughs> Worship God. Two different times he does this. It's fascinating. I wanna read for you with that in mind, how John was overwhelmed by one angel. I, I just want you to read this text, Revelation chapter five, starting in verse 11. This is what John sees in heaven. He says, then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders in a loud voice they were saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. 
And it's at this moment it says that the four living creatures said, amen. We are in full agreement, amen. And the elders fell down in worship. It's kind of funny. John <laughs> spends time with one angel and he's overwhelmed. <laughs> and then there's this scene. The number is far too many to count. It's 10,000 times 10,000 angels and they are overwhelmed by the one who's sitting on the throne, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, church, as we go into this season, you need to understand there is hope. Jesus, the mighty God, is working on our behalf. There is hope that no matter how much your life might seem out of control right now, Jesus is still on his throne. There is hope that one day the mighty God, the mighty almighty will come back and establish his eternal kingdom forever. Parkwood, there is hope. 